Good evening, dear friends, dear colleagues. Good evening, Peter. Good evening, Helmut. Uh, welcome to uh, another webinar. Uh, last week we had a wonderful webinar and uh, we start this new year and from my side and also from Peter, it's not too late to say a happy new year, a better new year than last year for everybody. Um, and ESG has great plans this year. And uh, as a president, I also had some plans. And one of these plans is uh, to have uh, an, a new series of webinars, which is called Paper of the Months. And um, I'm delighted that Peter will uh, join this uh, project as well. You, everybody knows him as the editor of uh, our channel Endoscopy. And the idea was to update you with the latest important papers, which probably has not been published in the paper, but online. We select in the next weeks always uh, interesting papers from different areas. And uh, we want to start today with uh, two papers. And the plan is that the first or the senior author will present his paper. And then we have another expert who will have a critical comment or a comment at all on this paper. And at the end, you have the chance by Q&A to bring in your comments, your questions. And Peter and I are we happy to moderate and uh, discuss this paper. So for each paper, we have uh, 30 minutes time. And I think that is a nice um, start with a new uh, webinar. And I'm happy to say that we have almost 1,000 registered participants from all over the world. So welcome to everywhere. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are, are watching us. Well, this is some, some information for you. Um, you know that. Uh, as I already mentioned, you have the, the, the possibility to use the Q&A box, please use it. And, and then we are happy to discuss this um, with uh, all of you. Um, the next slide showed you the first paper and you might be uh, a bit mm, upset probably to say, well, why is it paper from Augsburg from the president's hospital? That could be a small privilege, Peter, isn't it? Uh, is that, is on the really... other hand, I'm really happy to say that my coworker, uh, Dr. Nagel, Sandra Nagel, she did a, a really great study, uh, a randomized study. Welcome, Sandra, this evening. Um, she will present this paper um, on a new technique, which is uh, not so familiar in, in, in every unit, but we know from data that it might be an interesting uh, a technique. And uh, I was really happy that uh, this paper was accepted in gastroenterology. And uh, to start this, to make a kick off, I suggested, Peter, Peter, what do you think? Can I suggest a paper from our unit? And Peter, I promise this is the only one this year. Um, but I hope and everybody who is listening is excited with this new data coming now from our hospital. And Dr. Nagel, she is uh, one of my senior uh, uh, gastroenterologists. She is uh, working for a long time in my hospital, is uh, uh, specialized in interventional endoscopies, doing nearly everything. So um, very, very uh, uh, good support for, for our unit, for me, and uh, also publishing a lot of interesting work. So uh, Dr. Nagel, please, it's now, your time to present your paper. So, um, good evening, everyone. My name is Sandra Nagel, and I'm a gastroenterologist at the University Hospital in Augsburg in Germany. And um, it is my pleasure to present the results of our randomized control trial underwater versus conventional endoscopic mucosa resection of large sessile or flat colorectal polyps, mm -hmm. which was published in Gastroenterology in November last year. The conventional endoscopic mucosal resection with submucosal injection is the current standard for the resection of large non-malignant colorectal polyps. 
And for colorectal polyps between 10 and 20 millimeter in size, underwater EMR has already been shown to be more effective than conventional EMR regarding the zero resection rate. And in our trial, we prospectively investigated whether underwater EMR is also superior to conventional EMR for large sessile or flat colorectal polyps between 20 and 40 millimeter in size. First of all, I would like to lose some words about the underlying concept of this technique. And this was um, observed underwater, during underwater colonic endosonography. That was observed that the mucosa and the submucosa flowed away from the deeper muscle layer, while the muscularis propria remains its circular configuration. And so that the resection of the polyp underwater can be performed without submucosal lifting of the target lesion. And water immersion also results in a less distension of the bowel lumen compared to gas insufflation, and therefore prevents larger lesions to further extend over the colonic wall. So it's even much larger lesion can be entrapped with a standard size snare and therefore more amenable for uh, in block resection. So this was a single center prospective randomized control trial conducted at the University Hospital in Augsburg in Germany. And between August 2017 and October 2020, all adult patients with sessile or flat colorectal polyps between 20 and 40 millimeter in size were eligible for possible randomization. The exclusion criteria included pregnancy, ASA classification three or higher, pitum-related lesions, residual lesions after endoscopic resection, familiar polyposis syndrome, lesions in patients with IVD, or lesions suspicious of deep submucosal invasion based on microscopic appearance, or of course patients unwilling to provide written informed consent. Here in this video, we see two very flat lesions, Paris 2A or 2B, according to the Paris classification, which are very close by each other. And here we see another advantage of underwater EMR, which is that water has a natural magnification effect, which improves the delineation of even these flat lesions uh, so that the lesion can be entrapped entirely with one snare capture. Here we see another flat lesion and water immersion results in a self-sustained elevation of the mucosa and the submucosa so that the large lesion folds up and appears more compressed and can be easily entrapped entirely with one snare capture. And after the resection, um, underwater also improves the detection of residual lesion at the resection scar. So the primary outcome of our trial was the recurrence rate after six months of violence colonoscopy between the both groups. Secondary outcomes included the block resection rate, the R0 resection rate, the number of resected pieces, the procedure time, and also the adverse events. So in total, 158 lesions and 147 patients were eligible and underwent randomization. Underwater EMR was not performed in one patient because um, the lesion was identified as carcinoma and microscopic appearance. So finally, 81 lesions were assigned to the underwater EMR group and 76 lesions to the CEMR group. And these are our results. Um, the median size between the both groups did not differ significantly. The block and the zero resection rate were significantly higher for the underwater EMR group. And always when we didn't achieve and block resection, we also analyzed how often it was possible to at least um, reset the entire lesion with two pieces. And there we have seen that the two pieces resection rate also differed significantly in favor of underwater EMR. 75% of patients um, 
attended surveillance colonoscopy after a median follow-up of six months, and the overall recurrence rate did not differ between the both groups. However, subgroup analysis showed a significant difference um, for the lesions 30 to 40 millimeter in size in favor of underwater EMR. The procedure time, which was defined as the period between the start of the polyp immersion in normal saline in the underwater EMR group or the submucosal injection in the conventional EMR group and the completion of the polyp resection has shown to be significantly better in the underwater EMR group. And regarding adverse events such as perforation or bleeding, we did not see any difference between both groups. So this is another aspect I would like to mention. Here we see again a large laterally spreading tumor, granular type, which is completely entrapped with the snare underwater. And after the resection, an intraprocedural bleeding occurred. And after cleaning the resection site and CO2 insufflation, the bleeding vessel was identified and the bleeding could be controlled by applying a hemoclip. And afterwards, the reception area was completely closed by hemoclips. And this was the resected vesium, where we can see nicely the block resection of the entire lesion. And histological assessment revealed a zero resection and a high grade dysplasia. So in our trial, intraprocedural bleeding was very rare, but it did not differ between both groups and could all be managed conventionally using hemoclips or coagulation forceps. And even if intraprocedural bleeding occurred in the underwater EMR group, in most cases, underwater EMR was able to be continued after bleeding control. Only in five cases, we had to switch from underwater EMR to conventional EMR uh, due to impaired visibility after the bleeding. So to conclude, Underwater EMR is superior to conventional EMR regarding in block resection or zero resection and the procedure time for large colorectal lesions. And underwater EMR shows significantly lower recurrence rates for lesions 30 to 40 millimeter in size. And therefore we believe that underwater EMR should be considered for the endoscopic resection of large colorectal polyps up to 40 millimeter in size. Thank you very much. Thank you for this. Uh... Nice presentation. Uh, and now I think it's time, Peter, to introduce our next speaker. Who will yes, come. I'm happy to do so. I think it was indeed a, a great paper to present and also a very important message for the clinical practice. Uh, this paper will be commented by uh, Dr. Maria Pelisse from, from Spain. She is a specialist in gastroenterology working in Barcelona. And she is also uh, our chair of the Equity and Diversity Working Group uh, of the ESGE. Uh, she, is, uh, she is a well-known leader in the field of advanced imaging and therapeutic endoscopy for colorectal lesions. Uh, and uh, I think she's in the perfect person to comment on this paper. Maria, please. So, thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, nice introduction, uh, Peter. And uh, I am very pleased to, to be part of this uh, first um, webinar. I am commenting on papers, which I think is very interesting and it has been a great idea. I'm very happy also to comment on this paper from Sandra, which I think is a, a very interesting paper. So um, that this, those are my conflicts um, of interest. And uh, well, when we faced a, a colorectal polyp, uh, we all um, have to ask us uh, two questions, if the lesion can be treated locally and if we can uh, remove it in piecemeal. Um, and this, this kind of um, questions uh, are conditioned by the fact that um, um, with respect um, of the histology of the lesion, um, the, the best approach uh, is, uh, for example, if it's a low-grade uh, dysplastic adenoma, we can remove it in piecemeal. Whereas if we have a, a polyp that has already inside to carcinoma or even a more a T1 carcinoma, it will be preferable to, to have a, an in block resection. And if the lesion is a deep T1 or mostly a T2 or T3 cancer, then we would need to do surgery. So 
uh, we first need to optically assess the polyp and decide which is the best technique. And here is where uh, comes the, 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 what the, the EHG uh, was um, recommending in their gui guidelines that were published in two, uh, 2017. And as you can see, um, for sessile or flat lesions um, larger than 10 millimeters, um, as I was saying, the first thing is to, to, to do advanced imaging to try to identify the presence of submucosal invasion. And after that, what is recommended is to, um, i sorry, I don't know, I had a, sorry, because, sorry, here, here we are. So what is uh, recommended is in case of a non-invasive lesion, um, we, can, we can do piecemeal EMR um, when end block is not possible or feasible or safe. Um, for lesions larger than 40 millimeters, refer them to, to an expert center. And when there is a suspicious of submucosal invasion, then we also have to, to try to do and block EMR or um, do ESD. So here is exactly where this paper from Sandra Nagel um, comes to, to talk about these parts where there is, um, when we want to try and block, and uh, here is where underwater EMR can, can give us an advantage or that was the hypothesis. So this is generally what we would do. We would do um, ESD or TAMIS for those ones that are in the lower rectum or where we have a high suspicious or of uh, deep submucosal invasion. And uh, for the rest, which will be 90% of the lesions, we will consider EMR. And when lesions are larger than 2025, 20, so um, if we do conventional EMR, we would probably do piecemeal EMR. Um, but of course, piecemeal EMR has um, adverse events, mostly bleeding and perforation. But what we are concerned here in this specific study and um, is the fact that it is also related with um, incomplete resection or recurrence uh, that will happen uh, mostly six months in the, after the, the procedure and even it can happen later on, which would be late recurrence, and that it is described that can happen in up to 30% of cases. Um, the, the, the group from Michael Burke in Australia have done this, um, a lot of work on that, but specifically I wanted to talk about this trial, this randomized trial that was published uh, one year or two years now ago, where um, um, applying um, thermal ablation to the margin of the scar, the, the, the rate of recurrence was clearly um, um, the, was much lower to 5%. And that has been replicated in another uh, study with other centers implicated. So um, even if recurrence can be avoided with this, um, uh, soft tip uh, treatment of the of the margin of the scar. There is still another issue on on piecemeal, and it's the fact that you will have a lot of um, small pieces of polyp, and this will probably impair a perfect um, histological diagnosis. It's not the perfect situation, especially for those lesions that can have. Um, in situ carcinoma, and uh, that maybe at some point it's difficult to, to assess the muscularis propia, the muscularis mucosa. And whereas when we do an underwater EMR and we, we take a, a one piece um, a polyp, we can have a better specimen. So this is another part where underwater EMR can provide a, a, a good uh, situation. So, um, uh, the, the results from the study from Sandra are very positive, even if their principal endpoint didn't show any difference in terms of recurrence. But um, I, I, I have some concerns. My, my major concern is on the lesion size, because even if the title of the paper talks about large polyps, in their um, cohort, uh, the polyps, the median size of the polyps was um, around <laughs> 20 to, to 30, 25, no? Most of the lesions, as you can see here, uh, 70 to 80% of the lesions were um, between 20 and 30 millimeters. And like the video she showed, it was not very large polyps. So it's large polyps because they are larger than 20, but they are not enormous polyps. They are just 20 to 30. 
And what we can see from the ACE cohort, which is probably the, the largest cohort that we have and with prospective uh, data, here is um, in this paper, the, the recurrence um, of lesions at six and 15 months um, have been um, shown uh, in relation with the sizes. And as you can see here, for lesions that are 20 millimeters, for cystic serrated lesions, the recurrence is zero. And for adenomas, it's less than 10%. And also for lesions from 20 to 30, which will be the ones that correspond to this study presented by Sandra Nagel, um, that the recurrence rate is quite low, it's below 10%. So um, we, we also know that um, in this other study from the ACE cohort, that uh, the fact of removing these kind of lesions that are between 20 and 25 end block or piecemeal doesn't have a, a, a clear um, advantage in terms of recurrence or surgery. So my question is, the study, your study, um, even if it was like for large lesions, at the end, you mostly included lesions 20 to 30 millimeters. So um, do you think that these um, results can be externalized to any large polyp, or do we have just to keep those conclusions to this kind of 20 to 30 millimeters? And do you think that the power of your study, the sample size was enough for answering this question with uh, these um, recurrences that have been demonstrated in previous studies? Okay. Of course, this is true. There were significantly more patients in this subgroup of 20 to 30 millimeters um, in size. But first of all, we have to note that there was no significant difference between the distribution between the both groups. And um, But it is true that the high end block and the zero resection rate of underwater EMR over conventional EMR was mainly driven by this subgroup of polyps, 20 to 30 millimeter in size, and might be limited to this. But um, the results regarding the subgroup of polyps with 30 to 40 millimeter in size might have been underpowered because of the low number of patients in this group. This is true. Um, but what we all, um, regarding the recurrence rate, we did see a trend, overall trend towards lower recurrence rate also in the underwater EMR group. But we might, uh, we also, it was not statistically significant, but we think that was due to the fact that the attendance to the surveillance colonoscopy in the underwater EMR group was significantly lower in the con than in the conventional EMR group. But we did see a significant difference um, in the subgroup of polyps 30 to 40 millimeter in size um, regarding re recurrence rate in favor of underwater EMR. And we don't believe that this is due to the fact that there was a lower number of uh, patients in this group, but rather to the fact that we were able to resect these large polyps with a minimum of sizes. And we all know that piecemeal resection is the major risk for recurrency and also that the um, number of piecemeal resect, uh, resection size, a uh, number of pieces constitutes as an independent risk factor for recurrency. So we believe that um, the low number of resected pieces in this large group was, um, was the reason why we've seen the, the low recurrence rate in the underwater group and this subgroup. And what we did see in the underwater, uh, performing underwater EMR, whenever it, we, uh, we didn't achieve in block resection, um, in many cases, only a minimal residual lesion was left, which was easily resected with another snare capture. And, um, I believe the great advantage of underwater EMR is that we can resect even large polyps and block, or at least with a minimum of pieces. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, um, also, the other thing that um, uh, when looking at your cohort, um, most of the lesions were located in the right column, and very few were in the rectum, whereas um, in other cohorts uh, reporting on large polyps, uh, at least 20% used to be in the rectum or in the sigmoid. Um, did you, did you, was it uh, all the patients were um, included prospectively and consecutively, 
or what did you had any kind of uh, did you choose the ones that were going into the trial how did you do that well we included all the patients with flat um, or sessile um, polyps and um, irrespective uh, with the size of 20 to 30 millimeter in size irrespective of the polyp localization and um, Yes, we, we, we've seen that 70% uh, of the polyps were located in the right colon, but this was rather incidentally. But important is that there was no difference between the both groups. And we also um, um, did a subgroup analyzing according to the polyp localization, the polyp morphology, and also the polyp histology. And we've seen an overall trend towards superior block and a zero resection rate for underwater EMR, irrespective of the polyp localization, um, morphology, or um, histology. And uh, finally, uh, because I think we've run a little bit short of time, um, I, I also um, saw that most of the lesions were removed by two, um, by two explorers. And in the UMR, I mean, the underwater um, site, um, even more by one of them, and that uh, removed 60% of the lesions. So um, uh, I think that this is also an important thing because um, it's Technically, I suppose uh, there is a, the, the fact of the technique, no? So uh, your recurrences are more or less similar to what was what was reported, a little bit higher for these uh, size uh, lesions, as I was saying in the conventional EMR. But what really struck my attention was the fact that in this uh, group of lesions that are larger, the 30 to 40, here the recurrence was really high, and here it was really low, which is really... I mean, it's not an intuitive result, one wouldn't think. So my question is, do you think that uh, the fact that this explorer, the, the operator A, did most of those ones could have an impact on the results? Do you think that this technique needs a learning curve? Uh, what, um, what is your opinion on that? Okay, the reason why um, only two operators in our trial um, performed underwater EMR was that at the beginning of the trial, we did not know if underwater EMR is easy to learn. So um, this was just determined in the, um, in the um, study protocol and we didn't want to change it during the course of the study. But we recognize that um, underwater EMR is really easy to learn without specific training. Everyone who is um, who can perform conventional EMR can easily adopt to underwater EMR. We also performed a subgroup analysis regarding the primary and secondary outcomes com um, comparing um, to each operator, and we did not find any difference um, regarding the primary or the secondary outcomes among each operator in each treatment arm and also not between each treatment arm. And regarding the high recurrence rate um, in the or the higher difference, this could probably be due to the lower number of, of patients in the subgroup of. Um, of um, polyp sizes. And regarding um, the question if underwater EMR is technically difficult in this trial, we did not see any lesion or localization to be difficult um, for underwater EMR. And other trials also have reported that underwater EMR is even feasible at the appendix orifice, at the ileocecal valve, and even for a current lesion where conventional EMR due to submucosal fibrosis is often more difficult. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Amelia, for this, for this, uh, for this fantastic uh, discussion. And I think important questions. Uh, we have some more questions in the q and I'm looking at my watch, uh, Helmut. Can we do one or two questions and then move I on? I think we, yeah, because I'm, I made a too long introduction of five minutes. So let's <laughs> okay. discuss until 35 and then we stop. So um, there are a couple of questions in the Q&A, uh, uh, Sandra. I, I think the first question has already been, been answered. 
Um, there's, an, I think, an important technical question uh, that comes in by Daniel Smith. Smith uh, Schmidt, maybe you can uh, answer this shortly. Is it possible to fill the column with water in every region? Mm, actually, yes, it is possible. Um, but after the lesion localization, it is very important before you start with the water filling that you remove all the gas um, in a first step, and then you start filling the the the, the bowl lumen and then of course it is is possible in every region right so that's important and are there different settings uh, for underwater emr is a question from carlos santos now we just use the same current settings as we use for conventional emr okay and then a final question and there's some more questions but maybe you can answer those questions yes of course uh, in the in the q a uh, coming from fernando martinez de juan is there any difference in efficacy and or safety between granular and non-granular lesions? Um, no, we didn't find any difference. As I told before, we did a subgroup analyzing uh, regarding polyp histology and polyp morphology, and we did not find any difference regarding the morphology or histology. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, a mm -hmm. fantastic paper, an important paper for the clinical practice. And uh, uh, and again, uh, Maria, thank you very much for your comments. Peter, before thank we you. go forward, uh, I would like to ask Maria as an expert. Oh, she's gone. No, Maria, come back. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was wondering, I was wondering, uh, this new technique, do you think this is my hypothesis that it is for a special group of polyp uh, ideal? So my idea was the so smaller the polyp, the less the benefit. So a one centimeter polyp with un underwater EMR is, is, is the same result. There's no difference in recurrence compared to conventional. Um, a two centimeter as well. There were data that the difference is not so. And, and on the opposite side, if the polyp, as you said, are really large, six, seven centimeters, I think for underwater EMR becomes technical too difficult. You have bleeding, which may occur. Dr. Nagel mentioned that bleeding did occur. Uh, obviously, I was one of the uh, uh, endoscopists who stopped the, had to stop the procedure. But my idea was, is there a special subgroup? And this was our finding. And do you think, is it is it worse now to, to think on this, that to have, well, there's a special group where we can do it? And another comment, um, which we had a, a letter from, from Mike Berg, um, is additional ablation of the margin necessary? And I would say, yes, it could be another trial, but very briefly, your, your expertise on this topic, because I know you're also doing underwater. Yes, um, actually we, have, we are also, you know, we also run a trial in Spain with this mm -hmm. multi-center and it has the, the double of size, so we, Probably will well. We have already the results. We are finishing it, and maybe we will be able to do this sub analysis. That would be interesting. Um, we also included lesions that were recurrences or previously attempted, which I think is a very good uh, focus for uh, on the water EMR. Those lesions that have previously been attempted and have a little bit of scar are really good for underwater EMR, and here it's a good advantage of this technique. And um, also, I have used it uh, quite often in the rectum for those lesions that are around 30, that when you do it with conventional EMR, you have a lot of probabilities of having a piecemeal, whereas you do it in, um, in block with underwater EMR, mm -hmm. and you, you don't need an ESD. But in the rectum, I think it's especially interesting uh, yeah. for this advantage. Okay. Um, of course, it, it will be interesting um, to, to have more things about diatermy as well, because the water makes the diatermy, probably the effect is less um, sharp. So maybe that will also have less complications, late complications, but we need larger numbers okay. for demonstrating okay. that. Thank so you we will your, see. Thank, thank you me. for your feedback you. on your trial. And now we can move forward to our second paper on this evening. And now it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce Professor Dennis Jensen, uh, welcome, Dean. Uh, professor Jensen is a is professor at the UCLA in Los Angeles, and to introduce him is um, 
either very difficult or very easy. You can also say, I'm introducing the Pope, the Pope of GI bleeding. Everybody who deals with GI bleeding knows him and knows his papers. He has published more than 300 papers, a lot of refuse book chapters, and was involved of many guidelines. And I think one of his most uh, 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 outstanding achievement was a Rudolf Schindler Award, which really is, I think, one of the highest privileges for uh, uh, endoscopists. And congratulations to this wonderful award. But now I think you you were now the first doing a randomized trial on a special technique um, with a over the scope clip. Um, and in Germany, we did a study. Uh, the sting trial on recurrence bleeding. And we were also involved in this study and we realized this is a nice technique, which is very, very successful. And now the consequence was that a couple of trials are now running as a first line treatment and your paper was published first. And I'm really happy to have you here. Good morning to Los Angeles <laughs> or lunchtime. Um, thank you for being here and thank you now for showing, sharing your data with us and discussing this paper, which will be discussed later on with Ian Gronik. Thank you, Dean. Well, thank you for uh, that kind introduction and um, your comments um, and happy 2022 to everyone. I hope it's better than last year. So this was published since CGH. Actually, it was published online a year ago, but um, uh, just recently in print. I have no disclosures to make, nor um, do others. This was uh, initially funded by the ASGE and a, an award and in part by um, the NIH through the Human Studies Corps which I um, direct. By way of background, um, at least here in high-risk patients, uh, recurrent bleeding from ulcers and dilophoise lesions uh, is common. And we have uh, published in gastro not too long ago that standard uh, visually guided treatment is associated with a 26% recurrence rate which was significantly reduced if you uh, used a Doppler probe uh, to get rid of the underlying arterial signal. Um, we think that the uh, Avesco obliterates uh, arterial blood flow underneath stigmata better. And that's from an observational study that I'll show you the data at the very end. When this was uh, planned and um, finally published, there were no uh, treatments or reports randomized trials of initial hemostasis for non-variceal bleeding. And our purpose in this one was to do such a trial and compare it with current uh, treatment, which here is either hemoclips or multipolar probe with or without pre-injection of epinephrine. The specific aims then were to compare the outcomes um, of patients uh, with these two treatments. And the primary outcome was uh, more bleeding, uh, which is either continued bleeding or re-bleeding within 30 days. Uh, secondary outcomes were the usual, um, including uh, severe complications, deaths, transfusions, and hospital days uh, after randomization. This was conducted at UCLA and the VA where I work. It's registered for those interested in clinicaltrials.gov. Um, initially patients with severe bleeding were admitted to the hospital were screened according to uh, criteria that I'll go over with you. Um, and after randomization, importantly in this trial, the primary caregivers, um, including the ICU people were blinded as to the endoscopic uh, treatments that were administered. And they made all the decisions about whether the patient should have um, further treatment for rebleeding, whether they should have transfusions. Um, they were not given the discretion about treatment, which included uh, PPIs, of course, in the um, ulcer patients. So patients who add endoscopy 
uh, met clinical and endoscopic criteria uh, for either having major stigmata of hemorrhage or a flat spot uh, with the Doppler uh, showing under arterial or blood flow underneath it uh, were randomized in a one-to-one -one allocation by opening a, a, a sealed envelope. Um, the outcomes were the usually, uh, were as usual managed here with SAS and analyzed by uh, our UCLA biostatistician. The inclusion criteria included uh, clinical parameters, which you're familiar with, laboratory evidence, and transfusions. Secondly, life expectancy of at least 30 days, age over 18, written and formed consent from either the patient or a surrogate, and then the lesions I described um, with either having active arterial bleeding, oozing bleeding, non-bleeding visible vessel, adherent clot, or the flat spot, as mentioned with the Doppler positivity. Exclusion criteria um, were do not resuscitate, uncooperative patient or unable to consent, um, GI or other malignancy with survival reduced, an ASA of five or moribund, um, shock unresponsive to usual medical treatment and transfusions, severe uh, coagulopathy with uh, platelets less than 20,000 or INR uh, greater than three or PTT greater than two times normal in spite of um, blood products. Some abs absolute uh, contraindication to urgent EGD such as suspected perforation and then a stricture of the foregut um, if a patient had cirrhosis with a recent diagnosis of varices and banding or ENT source of bleeding or portal hypertensive gastropathy bleeding, they were excluded, and as were patients who had esophagitis, cameron ulcers, angiomas, or UGI cancers as the site of bleeding. So this is a consort diagram. Originally, there were 346 patients um, assessed. 200 were excluded because they did not meet clinical or laboratory criteria. 146 were consented. 93 were excluded because they did not have endoscopic criteria. Many of them had clean ulcer bases, for example. Um, of the 53 randomized, 28 were allocated to, to uh, standard uh, therapy and all of them received it were followed for 30 days and 25 were allocated to the Avesco and similarly were followed for uh, 30 days. Nobody was lost um, and no one died in this trial. This shows uh, a challenging uh, ulcer, a very large uh, or giant uh, duodenal ulcer with a visible vessel here and some oozing um, observed earlier to be spurting. It was injected with dilute epinephrine. And this shows the challenge of, of placing, this is an 113A. Um, clip, a VESCO clip, pushing it through the pylorus, centering on the stigmata, and then uh, uh, finally deploying this device. And that's not always uh, as easy as it looks, and it requires some extra training, which we did in models and with videos among all the investigators who are skilled endoscopists here. I'm not going to go over all of this, but these are the baseline characteristics which are well matched with the Avesco in the middle and the standard there. Uh, whether you look at the types of lesions, most of which were ulcers, uh, the stigmata of hemorrhage of note is that the ulcer size, um, the median size was 11 to 12 millimeters with almost 50% of these patients having uh, ulcers. Um, greater than 15 millimeters in size. The only difference on this was the PTT, somewhat higher in the Avesco group. Um, other characteristics uh, are shown on this slide and summarized in the paper. It's of interest as uh, you might know, at least in the United States, uh, HP positivity is rare. Most of these are NSAID ulcers or related or idiopathic. And regarding the ASA classification, we had high-risk patients, quite a number of them ASA three and four, 
and the, uh, a few with uh, cirrhosis. As to the primary results, uh, the 53 patients as shown were well matched. Um, however, the 30 day rebleeding rates were significantly higher in the standard group that was eight out of 28, which is 28.6% uh, compared with the Avesco group, 4%, highly significant by log rank test. Um, this uh, rebleed rate in the Avesco group was 90% lower than the standard group shown here are the confidence intervals. Importantly, clinically, the number of patients needed to treat is only four. These show the uh, Kaplan-Meier uh, curves for all patients. Um, and most of the rebleeding in this case occurred within the, the first um, four days, although there were a couple of delayed bleeds. These show other outcomes uh, of interest um, and the complication rate was uh, higher in the standard group, I'll discuss that in a second. Also, the number of uh, transfusions after randomization was higher, arithmetically higher are the hospital days and the ICU days. What were the complications? Well, they were related to further bleeding, one stroke, worse heart failure, one aspiration, pneumonia, and one bleeding ischemia related to embolization that was done. So. Bleeding here, it's interesting. Uh, they don't always transfuse the patients because there are restrictions which are reported from Spain um, in a New England paper, but that really does not pertain to the type of patients we see here with more many comorbidities. They need to be transfused probably to a hemoglobin above eight. So the results by stigmata of hemorrhage um, for patients who had oozing bleeding, that's forest 1B, or flat spots, forest uh, 2C. None of these patients had rebleeding, whether they were treated with standard hemostasis or the CLIP. They would not benefit from a VASCO. You can use just standard hemostasis on them. On the other hand, um, patients who had major stigmata, that is arteri active arterial bleeding, visible vessel or clot, um, in the standard group accounted for all the rebleeding, which was 34.8% of them compared with 5.9% uh, in the Avesco group. Um, so the number of needed to treat of patients with major stigmata, it's only three and a half. Um, and they're the ones that would benefit most um, from uh, this large clip. Shown here are uh, ulcer patients, the subgroup, which is the largest uh, group, and the Kaplan-Meier curves, again, which are highly significant. Just looking at ulcers, the number needed to treat is four, 4.2. Looking at patients who have major stigmata of hemorrhage, similar findings, um, number needed to treat um, is three and a half. Um, so, it's of interest to compare the Sting trial, or pardon me, um, of Schmidt et al, as uh, Helmut referred to, and our trial. These are quite different in methodologies and also um, in some of the results. Uh, they had 66 patients compared with ours, 53. Um, that was focused on retreatment of ulcer bleeding, whereas ours was initial treatment um, of either ulcers or dulafoys. Blinding wasn't done of the caregivers in the Schmidt trial, it was in ours. The number of centers was 19 in the Schmidt trial and it's just two in ours. Pre-study investigator meeting for standardization of techniques was not apparent in the Schmidt trial. We had that fairly rigorously as we have in other trials. Crossover for more bleeding was permitted in the Schmidt trial um, it was not in ours, which allows us to report other 30-day outcomes. The PPI infusion standardization was not obvious or stated in the Schmidt trial, whereas we made it quite um, mandatory uh, to the caregivers. 
As far as standard uh, therapy in the Smith trial, most of them had hemoclipping or injection, and there are very few with uh, cautery or multipolar probe, whereas with ours, there was an equal distribution of hemoclipping um, and MPEC. Um, the funding in our trial was NIH and the ASGE, and then the Schmidt trial was uh, the company, a VESCO company. And as far as the outcomes re, uh, reported by Schmidt at all, there was further bleeding at seven days and also for crossovers. And we reported not only further bleeding, but the other uh, complications, ICU days, et cetera, uh, post-randomization transfusion. So these are complementary studies, and it should be that the societies look at these for rewriting the standard of care and their guidelines, in my opinion, because they are randomized trials, uh, evidence-based. I've already stated the conclusions uh, for you. Um, I'm gonna emphasize a couple of points. This shows a picture of the uh, vascular technology um, uh, Doppler box and catheter, disposable catheters, which are available. They cost about um, 150 US dollars, these things, uh, and are very useful for detecting blood flow. To emphasize the importance of blood flow in several studies that we have done with ulcers, um, shown in green is the residual blood flow, shown in red are the rebleeding rates. So if you have residual blood flow after your standard treatment, you're going to have a high or correspondingly high um, rebleed rate within usually four days or so. If with successful Doppler guided treatment, you get rid of the blood flow, zero of 63, ulcer patients bled. Um, with the Avesco, as you saw, um, we studied this of the one patient who had residual blood flow with the Avesco, that patient rebled. So the message here is blood flow is important. And the last slide harkens back to Swain's old data with gastric ulcers. The, guy, the, the goals of hemostasis are not just to control active bleeding, but they are to prevent rebleeding. And the way you do that is to obliterate the underlying vessel, which is an artery. And you can guide that by Doppler quite well. Um, this is a major risk factor that is residual arterial blood flow underneath stigmata. Thanks for your attention. Glad you're interested in this paper. These are hard studies to do. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dean, uh, for this very interesting talk. And uh, I think the, the results that you presented are, are very impressive and uh, convincing. Um, this, this paper will be commented uh, by Professor Ian Grolnek from Israel. Uh, he is a clinical professor of medicine and gastroenterology. Uh, and he is also, as you all know, uh, uh, the, the, the president-elect of ESG. Um, um, Helmut uh, called uh, Dean the, the Pope of uh, GI bleeding. I would say that maybe uh, Ian is the, the, the chief cardinal of uh, GI bleeding uh, and, and really a second best. And, uh, uh, and, and therefore, uh, I would uh, ask uh, Ian to, uh, to comment on this, on this paper. Peter, thank you very much. That was a, a very kind introduction. And thanks, Helmut, for inviting me. And yes, I realized I didn't know I was trained by the Pope. I feel very important now, Dean. <laughs> I've known Dean for 30 years, believe it or not, which is sort of frightening. Um, but I commend, I commend Dean and the UCLA Cure Group on another uh, overall well done clinical trials. And I agree, I agree with Dean, these are not easy trials to run. I was there when some of the early trials were done and uh, uh, really Dean has put his heart and soul in his entire career looking at this and he should be commended for it. Um, I just want to sh show here is that, um, you know, Dean, we did use this study. It was online. I know it just came out, but uh, we did use the data from the study to help inform the updated guideline from the ESG on non variceal upper GI bleeding. This is just the flow diagram from the updated guideline that was published almost a year ago. And of course, with the high-risk endoscopic stigmata, the forest 1As and Bs and forest 2As, uh, 
Of course, we recommend uh, endoscopic therapy for the active bleeders, it's combination therapy. Uh, for the F2As or the non-bleeding visible vessels, it can be thermal mechanical or sclerosin injection as monotherapy or in combination with dilute epinephrine. Um, where we uh, also utilized um, uh, some of Dean's work is when we looked at actual persistent bleeding. So in other words, where standard endoscopic therapies were not working, uh, we suggested that in patients with such persistent bleeding that was refractory to standard hemostasis that we should be using a topical a hemostatic spray or powder or what we call a cap mounted clip. And I'll explain why I say cap mounted clip momentarily should be considered. Now, this was mainly expert opinion at this point because this is a weak recommendation with low quality evidence. Uh, however, we did use uh, uh, Dean's data and the data from the STING trial to inform our recommendation on recurrent bleeding. So these were patients who initially had a primary hemostasis, but then subsequently had recurrent bleeding. And we do recommend that for such patients uh, with recurrent uh, peptic ulcer hemorrhage that the use of a cat-mounted clip, such as the over-the-scope clip from Movesco, should be considered. And this is a strong recommendation with moderate quality evidence because there are now two randomized controlled trials that have in one way or another looked at this uh, question. So the reason we've called it a cat mounted clip is because commercially there are two uh, of these types of clips available. There's the Ovesco over the scope clip. There's also what's called the padlock from Steris, but the vast, vast, vast majority of data uh, looking at uh, GI bleeding and the use of uh, cat mounted clips is really with the Ovesco uh, device, which was used in both the Sting trial as well as in now Jensen's uh, study. So what are the other data? We've heard a little bit about this. The, really the initial study, uh, this was a retrospective multi-center European study, looked at 118 patients with non-variceal upper GI bleeding using over the scope clip as first line endoscopic therapy. This is called the Flet Rock study. And basically what they showed in this retrospective ob observational trial was that at least when using the over the scope clip, there was significantly uh, less re-bleeding in patients who were considered to be moderately high risk by Rockall score or at high risk defined as a Rockall score of eight or greater. They also found that there's significantly less uh, mortality in those patients who actually had evidence of re-bleeding uh, in the high risk Rockall. Uh, patients. Overall, they found there was primary hemostasis using the over-the-scope clip of 92%. I'm just going to show very briefly, this is a, a video um, that shows use of the uh, Ovesco over-the-scope clip. This is a, it's really sort of an oozing, there's a small ulcer there. This is not a Dulafloise lesion, this is a small uh, ulcer in the antrum. And, and this is just showing use uh, in a slightly pulsatile bleeding lesion, uh, use of the over-the-scope clip. And I'll start this other one now. Get that running. Uh, and you'll see here, I don't know why it's running so slow, at least on my computer, it looks like it's running slow. Uh, you'll see here then that the clip is uh, deployed eventually. And uh, as we've heard uh, from Dean earlier, you know, the main goal here really is to obliterate the underlying artery. And what is nice about using uh, the over-the-scope clip is that you grab a large amount of tissue. Uh, and uh, this is probably likely why you're not only getting good primary hemostasis, but you're also showing uh, less re-bleeding in, in studies. Uh, let me go on to the next slide. Um, this was also, this is from the Mayo Group. This was also published in 2018. They looked at this again. This was a retrospective uh, observational study that looked at patients with high risk uh, lesions, non virus lesions, but it was both upper and lower GI bleeding uh, with high risk for adverse outcomes. And really what they found is that when using uh, over the scope clip, uh, they had a, a, a efficacy of about 72%. And then lastly, we've heard about the STING trial. I'm not gonna go through this again, but again, these were patients who had recurrent ulcer bleeding. They were then randomized to either standard hemostasis or over the scope clip. And they found that significantly less further bleeding in those patients who were randomly assigned to receive over the scope clip. We heard this about this from, from Dean before. Um, 
I also show this video. Hopefully this is going to work a little bit faster. This is from Dr. Marine Camus from, from Paris. This is a very nice video. Um, and I'll show just parts of it. This is a very large fibrotic duodenal ulcer uh, that was just not able to be stopped uh, from bleeding with standard endoscopic therapy. You can see there's a through the scope clip there. They're injecting here. But this is a very large fibrotic uh, ulceration where I find that over the scope clips are extremely useful. Um, there is a learning curve for this. And there's a, a little video here that shows Marine uh, loading this onto the scope. It is somewhat similar to band ligation. So the learning curve, in my opinion, is not that steep. It's quite similar with the Ovesco device, uh, very similar or analogous to using a band ligating device. Uh, and you'll see here then that the scope is now reinserted after the uh, clip is loaded and uh, Marine finds the area where the bleeding is. And you can see here it has been deployed and the bleeding has been stopped. But it's very, it can be very effective in these large fibrotic excavated uh, ulcerations. So uh, a few comments here, and I'll, I'll ask Dean a, a couple of things here. Um, I think there were definitely study strength. This is of course a randomized controlled trial. Subjects were blinded. The clinical care team that was uh, caring for the patients were blinded to what treatment they received. Overall, it was a well-designed protocol with appropriate endpoints. And of course, these were very experienced investigators who are well known in doing randomized controlled trials in GI bleeding. Now, having said that, of course, there are some limitations. There are limitations to every study. Uh, there were a limited number of subjects. Uh, overall, there were 53 subjects that were included in this trial. There was somewhat uh, unequal distribution by randomization uh, in terms of there were more uh, forest 1As or active bleeders that were actually randomized to the standard hemostasis group uh, and more of the uh, uh, forest 2C lesions, the flat pigmented spots to the over the scope group. And um, I guess my one question to you, Dean, is do you think this made any difference? In other words, because you had these active bleeders and they were there was there were more that were uh, by chance randomized to standard therapy. Do you think that impacted maybe some of what you saw in your endpoints and your outcomes of the study? Well, we don't have any evidence for that. Um, we were able to stop the bleeding in all of them, and I think that some of these lesions are deceptive. Um, they may not be bleeding right the same way as when the patients present, and they are slow down a little bit. Some of them been treated with PPIs, which may modify it somewhat, but it's the underlying artery that's the problem. And the other thing that I would emphasize is the size of the ulcers. We fit, based on earlier trials about size of ulcers, something that's 15 millimeters or bigger is high risk. And basically all of the major stigmata have a very high um, level of high rate of finding an artery underneath. So in spite of not of what you see visually, it's what's underneath that matters. And we don't have a way of sizing the arteries, but some of them with standard hemostasis are, are very hard to uh, treat either co-op or you think you clip because of these through the scope clips are not very strong. So I think it's a deceptive, this we're fixated on this, uh, you know, forest classification, and I think we need to go beyond that. We need to combine that with what um, is blood flow. So, do I think that it made a difference? No. We've done more patients. We have about sixty patients now. There's more balance, and it doesn't make any difference. The results are are just the same. So, so that sort of brings me to one of these other points here. I'm going to skip all over the do the flies, but. Because I know you guys have done this work using the uh, Doppler Pro, and and I I understand exactly what you're saying. So one of the issues, I guess, that some of us would say is that that impacted the stratification because it was not currently it's not the norm right now. Um, the question is going to be, and how generalizable is it? I understand. I hear what you're saying. The question is going to be, Dean, uh, are we going to have to adapt from visual or change from visual? stigmata to where use of a Doppler probe to measure underlying blood flow becomes more standard because you know right now it's not standard. People, that, that's not routine. People are not using this routinely. 
can you well just they should it's, about that they should have they should it's inexpensive it's available you can buy the box for under uh, two thousand bucks us and the catheters cost 150 or so um if you're going to improve hemostasis uh, not everybody's going to be able to use nor afford a vesco they cost you know, quite a bit of money, uh, 500 to um, $800 uh, dollars US. I don't know in Europe now, but um, you guys may get a discount, but I don't know. Um, so if you're going to improve hemostasis is a very simple technique uh, with ulcers. There are many other applications, including um, preventing delayed post polypectomy bleeding uh, and using it as a risk stratification. So the results are generalizable because the only in this trial, the only way Doppler was used, the only group it was used in was a flat spot group. And we mm -hmm. only put, we only enrolled patients who had flat spots who had an artery underneath because we know that that happens in flat spots about 45% of the time and about half of them re-bleed if you don't treat them. So that's the only group. So Doppler, on this trial, Doppler was not involved. I gave that as background information, um, so, but no, I so, don't. But, but I don't. But I think you, but, if you have patients with flat spots, you can treat them with anything. Oozing, you can treat them with anything. But do you do you recommend if you see a flat spot and you, you have the ability to use a Doppler probe? Do you recommend to use the Doppler probe? And if you see a signal, you would then basically bring that flat spot from a low risk lesion to a high risk lesion. Well, it's not. It's an intermediate, intermediate, but because um, the rebleeding rate is around twenty percent. The point is, I would treat it if it had it okay. underneath. And I will tell you, with diverticular bleeding, which we're not talking about here, if you find a spot on the neck or in a diverticulum, the the rate of finding an artery is about eighty-five or ninety percent. And if you leave them alone most of them re-bleed. So it's very different in other lesions. So, I mean, spots are only visual. And I, the point here is, why wouldn't we use some new technology beyond what we can see? EUS uses it. They use Doppler in neurosurgery, urology, every other field. Why wouldn't we use it? I think it's a cohort effect that people weren't taught to use it. It's very simple to use. It's inexpensive and it improves outcomes. Um, but again, in this study, don't be confused. Um, Doppler is not driving this study. It's a visual stigmata and those are generalizable if you teach people how to use them. Okay, so my final thoughts are because we're really over time right now. I thought overall, this is a good study. I think it's absolutely novel. It significantly adds to the uh, GI bleed hemostasis literature. I think that more randomized trials are needed. I think we're going to see that. I think we're seeing an increased use of, of uh, products like uh, the over the scope clip. Uh, I think that the learning curve of using something like the OTSC is manageable. And I think that this type of a device should be in our hemostasis tool toolbox. And uh, Dean, I think you and everybody at Cure and, and uh, West LAVA need to be commended on doing uh, what is a very difficult randomized controlled trial. So kudos to you guys. Thanks. Well, we of course uh, fully agree. Uh, we very much enjoyed the presentation. We enjoyed the discussion between the two of you, two uh, experts in the field of uh, managing the eye bleeding. It's always a pleasure listening uh, to. Uh, there, there are a few more questions in the Q&A, but uh, Helmut, I think it's a little bit too late to answer maybe, them yeah, live. Maybe. Huh? We, we still we still have over 300 people on the line uh, we, can answer a yeah i would i would suggest is this the first meeting it's like a very exciting football game 90 minutes are over <laughs> and now we have additional time for a couple of questions uh, <laughs> and, uh, and the additional time because one I, I would like to to ask dean there is a a question a comment from arthur schmidt he's also oh, yeah. uh, in the audience uh, arthur uh, uh, is asking First of all, he congratulates you to this wonderful study, but is asking why did you include uh, Forest 2C and how did you manage uh, the recurrent bleeding if uh, crossover was not allowed? So why didn't you use um, the Ovesco 
uh, clip if there was a rebleeding. How did you treat these lesions? Well, thanks, uh, Arthur. Sorry, I haven't met you uh, recently at meetings. Um, yeah. We included the forest, uh, um, you know, to see the the flat spot because of the data I showed you, and and we commonly see them. That is, uh, if you study them with the, this is with ulcers, peptic ulcers. If you study them with the Doppler, about. 45% or so have an artery underneath. And if you leave them alone, a little over 20% now in our studies, uh, just with PPI and so on, no endoscopic treatment bleed. And we feel that that's too high. The ones that don't have an artery don't bleed. I mean, arterial signals. So we included them for that reason. As you saw from the data though, um, we consider that a lesser stigmata. And if uh, um, they don't benefit from a VESCO uh, in our, experience in peptic ulcers and other things like uh, diverticular bleeding, um, you know, they do. Um, so that's why we included them. Okay. And I think there's another important question. Uh, this comes from Akin Inderson. Uh, the efficacy seems convincing. He, he, I think it's a he as uh, uh, he says. But what are the chances of severe adverse events? Uh, for example, if there is the CB, CBD close to the uh, to the place where the ulcer is, uh, is there any chance uh, of of damaging the CBD or an other critical structure? What do you think, uh, uh, Dean? Well, you know, in this we didn't find any major complications. I know in some of the other trials. You know, you can get obstructive symptoms if you if you put a, a vesco too close to the um, um, the pylorus, for example, or even in the esophagus. You know, if you treat ulcers like that, you can get symptoms. Um, we've used these for diverticular bleeding and haven't seen any complications. It's unbelievable, but we use the the eleven three a, which is eleven millimeters diameter. The cap is three millimeters because it allows you to suction and then the A is not uh, spiked teeth. So we haven't seen complications, although that's theoretically possible, particularly if you're using larger clips as we use, for example, in the colon or for rectal ulcers and so forth. You know, I didn't comment on um, um, the earlier question by Dr. Schmidt about how we treat rebleeders in the standard group. Well, we would treat them probably with triple therapy, injection, then cautery, then clipping, um, or in the patients that the blinded uh, primary care people sent to angio, they'd embolize them. Um, and, you know, that happened to be in a couple of cases where the ulcers were really large in the duodenum and some of these, as you, as I had pointed out, or others, big fibrotic ulcers. Um, you just can't treat well with through the scope technology. It's very difficult. But in ours, we didn't have crossover and the IRBs were good with that. Now, I think it's come to the point you couldn't do that anymore. The standard of care would be you'd have to, you'd have to, have to cross them over, I think. Maybe, Maybe one, just what, well, sorry, oh, Helmut, please. No, I was, I was actually, because I think that's important also for the young people that are uh, attending this this webinar uh, what about training how can you train to use this otc um, in in this in this clinical situation uh, how, what did you do in in, in your uh, at your place well, we uh, there's uh, three parts of the trial i mean there are expert endoscopists and they haven't used these before but you can use models and you can use tissue models endoscopic um i mean marine Camus, who's one of our, <laughs> also one of our trainees for a time, um, showed that on the plastic. But I think you have to go beyond that. So you have to use these animal models. Some of them were used in Germany before, or you can use plastic models through an endoscope. Not only the loading of them, but also the deployment and at an angle and in retroflexion and so forth. The second bit of training was we had a bunch of cases that we had done and did videos and, and edited the videos that showed each of the investigators what some of the nuances were and the tricks. And there was, 
I think that's something that you have to do before you start such a trial or um, it doesn't work. Lastly, we went over the protocol, what the exclusions are. I mean, you, if you have somebody with esophageal stricture or even somebody intubated, it's very difficult sometimes or impossible to pass this large um, a VESCO, which has a keel on it. It's not 11 millimeters, it's like 14. And I showed one in the duodenum. You might have to dilate the pylorus sometimes. So I think to go over the protocol the exclusions and so on is so critical in this kind of a, a trial. In practice, I don't know. At, at some of the national meetings, and I know you guys have the same, they have these workshops. And with what I just mentioned, they have uh, plastic models or others that you can practice. And what they don't have is the videos, actually a critical video, you know, videos that are helpful to show what to do and what not to do. Um, okay. And there's been a lot of issues. If you put these in the wrong place, you can't get them off. I mean, there's a cutting device, but boy, that, you know, it's an electrical thing. You can't use it in somebody who's got a pacemaker or anything else. So it's, it's, a, it's an issue. Maybe one final question, which is so interesting, but I think we can just speculate. What happens to patients in 20 years if we leave the, this uh, a clip inside? So uh, uh, Nick George asked, what do the faculty feel about the potential long-term effects of Ovesco? Could there be a risk 20 years later? Oh, well, you know, I would, let me mention one other thing. Any clipping does not cause any tissue damage whereas cautery does, and to some extent, these chemicals that are injected. So we've looked at this, you know, at some of the pathologic specimens, and you can compress the artery, but you don't get ischemia or any other major problem as you do in angiography. When do these fall off? You know, it depends on um, where they are with dulafoys and soft tissue and that. I mean, they may stay on a year. Well, what's wrong with that? It doesn't yeah. interfere with nutrition. Um, in the colon, they don't stay on quite as long. In the duodenum, not as long. But they do stay on longer than regular through the scope clips, um, which, you know, haven't interfered. I mean, we've been using those for what, since the 70s? They haven't killed anybody yet. They may not be able to go through, a, um, you know, the airports with them or whatever. Okay. <laughs> okay. So they seem so to be safe. Yeah. Before people yeah. Overall, I think I think that they're safe, and it doesn't yeah. stop people from getting MRIs in the future yeah. if they need yeah. to. Things yeah. like that. Yeah. So before Peter makes a conclusion, uh, a last question to our commentator to Ian. Uh, there is a question: Why don't we uh, um, uh, why don't we the the double blood flow not in uh, having our guidelines recommended? Say again, I didn't hear what you said. Why don't we have what? The double blood flow measurement is not recommended in the ah. HG guidelines. No, they're not. Why not? They're not at this point. Be because the data, we did not feel, the group did not feel at this point that there was enough data outside of really from Dean's group okay. to show that, that at this point, this would be mainstream. And I think mm -hmm. that other places need to, to replicate those okay. studies that Dean and the CURE group has done. And I think what, once that's done and there's more additional data, then I think it's something that should be considered when we go to update those again. Okay. And, and well, it'll, be, it'll be interesting too for you to see the results of a prevention of delayed post polypectomy bleeding in high risk patients using yeah. this. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's yeah. um, you know, everybody does, I don't know, okay. 20 colonoscopies every two days, but uh, you don't see these also. That's where the money is. And I think if you guys don't get into this, you're, you know, you're behind the eight ball. You just, you just are out of it. Okay. Then thank you both again. <laughs> this was a great discussion. This was a wonderful presentation. And Peter will kill me right now because I promised that we will be in time, which is usually typical for Germans, but <laughs> I'm obviously not the typical German. I'm a perverse. I was going to say, you're not acting very German helmet here. You're 20 minutes. Well, this is sorry, uh, sorry for the delay. No, but I was, it was so exciting. I think it was an exciting was discussion. Eh? Both. Thank you again. Yeah. Yeah, okay, no, I, I fully agree. I mean, it was an exciting presentation, exciting discussion. 
and I think it's uh, it's now time to wrap up. Um, so uh, here you see um, uh, an important uh, slide: the ESG days uh, coming very soon now. So please uh, 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 join us uh, over there. Um, and of course, uh, why is it important to join us? Because it's a full day of life endoscopy uh, uh, sessions in, in three days time. Uh, uh, many societies joining, hands-on training, and also uh, uh, a large number of faculty members presenting interesting papers, but also uh, information that's, that is important for daily clinical practice. Um, of course, uh, it's also to, uh, to highlight uh, the, the, the My ESG Tutor and also the ESG Quality Check uh, app. Uh, please uh, check it out. And, uh, and finally, of course, uh, I like uh, uh, also to mention that next week there will be our, we will have our next uh, uh, webinar, the Fujifilm EGE Satellite Symposium from screening to treatment challenges and solutions in basic uh, ERCP. And finally, I like to thank uh, the presenters. I like to present the discussions. I like to present my co-chair, uh, Helmut Neumann. And of course, also the people who made this possible, David Inker and uh, Gabriella Farga, and of course, the ESG Governing Board. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy your evening and, and look forward to see you next week uh, again for our series of webinars. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Everybody, goodbye. It was fun. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody, thanks again. It was great. Thanks, Dean. Good to see you. Take care. Bye.